Book 3, Chapter 69, Continuing with Verse 33. All these prospective worlds are machinations and the workings of the mind. Having forsaken these false fabrications of fantasy, you will have tranquility of your mind and abide in peace with yourself forever. By paying your attention to the drift of my preaching, you from your own reasoning will be able to find a might of the medicine that cures all illnesses of your deluded mind. So what Vasishta is telling us here is what we've been saying from the beginning. That by paying attention to the Yoga Vashishta, the words of the Yoga Vashishta, that means paying your attention means being established in the silent witness because this is where your attention really exists. Then all of the imperfect knowledge constructs that exist at the basis of your individual karmic traces will be balanced. If you sit in silent meditation, you will see the whole world in your mind. All outward bodies will disappear like drops of oil and sand. Now this concept of sitting in silent meditation, we're talking about being established in the silent witness again. That seems obvious. The mind is the seat of the universe as long as it is not weakened by passions and affections and afflictions of life. And of course, these passions, affections, and afflictions, these are individual karmic traces. When the mind is rid of the turmoil of the present state, it is set beyond the world in heavenly bliss. In this case, he's speaking of the mind as the silent witness. The mind is the means to accomplish anything. It is the storekeeper to preserve all things in the warehouse of its memory. It is the faculty of reasoning and the power to act like a respectable person. Therefore, the mind is to be treated with respect as it recalls, restrains, and guides us in our pursuits and duties. Now, this is an interesting statement. He's not referring to the silent witness here, we know because he says that the mind recalls, restrains, and guides us in our pursuits and duty. This is a clear definition of what? The ego. So now we're seeing that this concept of the mind is being transformed into the ego instead of the mind in verse 36, which is the seat of the universe.
we see the Sanskrit, we might find a slight difference in the words referring to the mind. The mind contains within it the three worlds with all their contents and the surrounding air. It exhibits itself as the fullness of ego and the cornucopia of all its microcosm. The intellectual part of the mind contains the subjective self-consciousness of ego, which is the seed of all its powers. The other part, its subjective part, bears in itself the false forms of the dull material world. So in this case, what we're talking about, when we speak of the mind in verse 38, and how the mind has parts, intellectual part, and the objective part, Obviously, this is not the silent witness. Silent witness is unity, wholeness. One without a second. Universal, pure consciousness. So he is speaking of not the silent witness, but in this case, but he is literally speaking of the ego. The ego is the false conception of self generated by the noise of the karmic traces. Verse 40, the self-born Brahma saw the yet uncreated and formless world as already present before his mind in its ideal state, like a dream at its first creation. He saw it mentally without seeing it actually. He saw the whole creation in the self-consciousness of his vast mind. And he saw all material objects, the hills and all, in the knowledge, sounded, of his gross personal consciousness. At last, by his subtle sightedness, sukshma subtle knowledge or clairvoyance, he perceived that all gross bodies were as empty as air and not solid substances. The mind with its embodying thoughts is pervaded by the omnipresent soul that is spread out as transparently as sunbeams upon clear water. So now what is he talking about? The self-born Brahma, the creator of this universe, Ultimately, each one of us is not different from this self-born Brahma. We are the self-born Brahma. We are acting as individuals, but that's only because we are operating within the dream of the universe. It said he saw it mentally without seeing it actually. He saw it present before his mind in its ideal state like a dream at its first creation. He saw the whole creation in the self-consciousness of his vast mind. So this is describing the process that we went through to create this universe. We had a memory. 
of an ideal universe. This memory is the memory of Goloka. Then we went through a process of creating the universe by performing sanyama on all the syllables of the Rig Veda, 432,000 souls. This sanyama is just like the sanyama we perform now in the Sahasra Sirsha Brahma meditation. We think a sutra, and simultaneously we imagine what this sutra means. And then back to samadhi, dropping that single pearl into the ocean of pure consciousness. And from that arises whatever is the meaning of that sutra. So to create this universe, we would begin with the syllables of the Rig Veda, Agni, Ile, Guru Itam. Those are the first eight syllables. So we perform Sanyama on A and then on Ni, then on Mi, then on Le, and so on. And as we perform Sanyama on A, we would imagine that quality. And then back to Samadhi and the quality would appear. So this is how the universe arises. We ignite a waking induced lucid dream that brings forth in our consciousness the quality of our Then we bring forth the quality of me. And in this sanyama, each dream adds to the first dream. So this is an advanced state of sanyama that we have not begun to practice yet. When we practice our sanyama, we let go of whatever is the current dream, and we create a whole new dream. This is not what the creator is doing. He is literally creating compound dreams. And these are not like dreams within dreams. There's a movie, I think, called Conception or Inception. One of those. <laughs> In which the hero is having dreams within dreams. No, we're not doing dreams within dreams. We're creating a compound dream. The first dream um, does not end. It continues, and the second dream, ni, embellishes it. And then the third syllable, 
me further embellishes the dream, which is a combination of Agni, Agni. Uh, is then embellished with me and so on. So this is how the universe is literally created in our mind. And then as the universe is fully created at the last syllable of the Rig Veda, we then simply enjoy. So it's a different strategy than we use at this time, but it is basically the same, the same process of sanya. In verse 43, otherwise the mind is like an infant who views the appearance of the world in its unconscious sleep of ignorance, but being awakened by consciousness, it sees the transcendent form of the self or soul without the mist of delusion. This delusion is caused by the part of the mind that is aware of physical senses. And it is removed by the reasoning faculties of consciousness. Now we see that the role of the senses are like hooks that grab onto the dream, grab onto components of the dream, like hooks or hands, and they grab these components of the dream, they hold on to them. And when they do this, it causes our consciousness to become embedded in the dream. We lose our lucidity. We lose them because we're losing our physical senses. We're losing the aloofness of our senses by focusing on our physical senses. There are two levels of senses that we have access to in the Yoga Sutras. This is clearly expressed as Pratibha Darshasa, that is the Pratibha beyond relativity, absolute Darshasa, vision. Pratibha Varta, Pratibha Veda, and so on. So these are the five absolute senses. The physical senses are illusory. They are created within the dream of this universe. So when the mind allows itself to be when the mind, again, now we're using that same word to describe everything. When the silent witness is lost, when the sense that I am pure being and I am not the senses, I am not the physical senses, I am the absolute unbounded pure awareness. When that realization fades away, 
then we're captured by the physical senses. Or we could be captured by celestial senses, not necessarily the physical senses, but any of the senses that are associated with the dream of this universe. And when we notice that happening, as long as we still have this awareness of the silent witness, it is possible to regain the identification of the silent witness at that point. But if we lose that connection with the silent witness, then we're lost again in the dream. Like losing our lucidity in a lucid dream. In a lucid dream, we can become vividly aware and totally aloof from the dream. Very comparable experience to being established in the silent witness and observing the world with our absolute senses. We're not, of course, we're observing only from our illusory senses because we're within a dream of our mind and this mind is not established in the silent witness. But it's a good um, comparison and we can make this connection. When we are fully established in the silent witness, Twenty-four hours a day, we've achieved emotion. When there are no dreams, now, there may be some dreams in early stages of moksha. Moksha level one. These are always. Dreams occurring in the conscious thinking mind that we are witnessing from the silent witness. And these dreams are not as strong as the lucid dreams that we had before our connection with and becoming completely identified with the silent witness. These dreams are caused by always individual karmic traces, but they are residual movements of individual karmic traces. And they don't capture us, dragging us back into relativity. But before this state of moksha, we can reach a state that is parallel to moksha, in which within this illusory universe, we identify with an illusory silent witness. This is very useful because it gives us this experience of what it is like. And then as the experience dawns in reality, we know what it is. Also, we realize the experience of being truly connected with the silent witness creates a lucidity 
but is far greater than the lucidity of a typical lucid dream. But it's a good experience serving as a metaphor for us to see how the consciousness expands and operates from the level of the sound of Verse 44, here now, Rama, what I'm going to say about how the soul is to be seen in this world of phenomena that is the cause of misleading the mind from its knowledge of the unity to the false notion of the duality. What I will say by opposite similes, right reasoning, graceful style, and good sense of the words in which they shall be conveyed to you cannot fail to come to your heart. By listening, your heart will be filled with a delight that will pervade your senses like the oil upon the water. Vasishta is basically revealing his strategy at conveying the divine karmic traces <clears throat> in words. This is basically the reverse of creating the universe, isn't it? We create the universe, Agni, Ile, Oro, Itam, performing Sanyama on each of those syllables, imagining their quality, letting go of that quality, back to Sanyama, observing from Samadhi. how the quality adds to the previous quality, compounding into ultimately the entire universe as a dream within our mind. Now we're going the other way. We're describing the whole of the dream in minute detail to bring us back to that state in which we were as the silent witness without the dream of the universe. So we're just going in reverse. That's the purpose of the Yoga Vashishta. Once you've taken <clears throat> the dream of the universe and de deprogrammed it, um, decompiled it, taken it back to its original machine language state, if we're talking in terms of computer programming. Computer programming is a pretty good analogy because um, there are a couple of layers of computer programming. If you know anything about computer programming, you may be familiar with some of the languages of computer programming. Fortran, COBOL, Cold Fusion, PHP. These are different programming languages. Now, these languages are sitting on top of a layer of compilation or translation that translates the various English readable statements, which may be something very similar, such as set this variable equal to that value, 
for example, and translates that into underlying machine code. Machine code, instead of being words that are easily recognizable in your language, are basically just numbers. 48, 16, 12, 32. That might be what set X equals 25 translates into. And then on that level of machine language, where 48 means set something equal to something else, and 16 means a variable which I'm going to call X in English. It translates that into this machine code, and then the machine language must be further translated into binary. And the binary is what the computer actually receives as its instruction. So the binary for 48 is a rather long string of zeros and ones in a certain combination that is uniquely identified with 48, for example. And these binary codes are the deepest level, deeper than the Rig Veda. The Rig Veda would be Agni Vile Urovita, deeper than Rig Veda is the binary code for Ag. Now, fortunately, or this is just the way it works, when we think Ag, the binary on off codes beneath the word or syllable og are automatically generated. Mm -hmm. Like the opening scene of the matrix. If you Recall that movie, which you see in the opening scene of The Matrix, are just a screen full of zeros and ones. Binary. Well, at the most fundamental level, when we're dealing with pure consciousness, it is a binary phenomenon. And it basically is composed of zeros and ones. The zero is pure consciousness. The one is pure Krishna. On its most fundamental level. So computers give us a very good metaphor as well as how the universe functions. Well, the speech level is a few levels beyond the binary code. The archetype is a symbol or understanding that is common to all. Yes. 
So in verse 46, Shishtar goes on to elucidate his method, which is literally the method of creation, reverse engineering or decompiling the universe. That's what the Yoga Vasishta is <coughs> in computer language. Yoga Vasishta is a universal, universe decompiler. You know, you can decompile programs that have been compiled and are operating and working by using these other programs called decompilers. They will take an operating program where you do not have any record of the programming code that was used to create the phenomenon that the computer is now expressing. And it will analyze the expressions of the computer, the functions, the things that it's doing. And it will produce the code that was used to create that. That's not perfect. It won't necessarily produce the code exactly, but it will produce working computer code that can be then compiled again and cause the computer to act the way it was acting before. Well, we are decompiling the universe now. And once we have it fully decompiled, we can then recompile. But this time, when we recompile it, it will be recompiled from an awareness of all the components that go into making the universe function. So we'll be observing the universe from a higher level. This will give us the experience of being the creator of the universe. Verse 46, <clears throat> speech, which is without suitable comparisons and graceful phraseology which is inaudible or clamorous or has inappropriate words and harsh sounding letters cannot take possession of the heart. Now, what he's saying here is any kind of speech which is inaudible, clamorous, inappropriate words and harsh sounding letters, obviously cannot be the symphony of divine karmic traces. Because divine karmic traces are like a beautiful symphony with 150,000, 432,000 instruments, all playing in perfect harmony, all playing the exact same ultimate song, and that ultimate song is the universe. And so if any of those syllables of the Rig Veda are 
inappropriate, clamorous, or harsh sounding, they're not accurate, then you won't get a beautiful symphony. And only a beautiful symphony can take possession of the heart. And we don't like to hear it. This is why orchestras practice. Because they want to get it right. So everyone listening will take this music into their heart. It will become part of and resonate with their inner core, with their being. Beautiful music. resonates with the divine karmic tracing. That's what makes it beautiful. That's what makes it Mozart or Bach or any of the classical compositions. When the composers were composing this music, they were tapping into the Sympathy, sym symphony of the universe. They were just basically recording what they were experiencing on the level of the silent witness. And when you're listening to a beautiful symphony and every instrument is playing perfectly and the music is so incredible. <clears throat> it resonates with the divine karmic traces and takes you to the divine karmic traces in your awareness. And that's bliss. And it's very enjoyable. Verse 47, whatever stories there are in any language on earth and whatever compositions are adorned with measured senses and graceful diction, all these are rendered acutely insightful through conspicuous comparison. As the world is enlightened by cooling Mundi. Therefore, almost every verse in this work is embellished with a suitable comparison. Again, this is like a symphony. <clears throat> there is a melody in a symphony. Maybe just four or five or six notes that you hear throughout the symphony. This melody is then embellished by other harmonious tones and sounds to add a sense of fullness to the whole symphony. Now the melody of the universe is the Rig Veda. It's a kind of a long melody, 432,000 notes. But nevertheless, that is the melody of the universe. And when the melody of the universe is embellished with the combination of all of these syllables sounding together, then the fullness of the universe emerges. 